Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Foreman community demo. So if you have any questions, please feel free to write to us on the Foreman at LibreChat or into the YouTube uh, live chat, as both will be monitored. And as usual, if you have any problems with the live stream, if it's buffering, et cetera, please let me know and I'll send a link where you can come and join us over on the Google Meet. At the moment, everything looks okay, but um, I'm going to upgrade my internet soon. So hopefully we, these things will be a problem of the past. Um, so before we begin today, just a few short announcements. So since the last time we met, uh, Foreman 3.0 has been released, and it was quite the milestone with the extraction of Puppet from Foreman Core to a plugin. And today we just so happen to have uh, Andra with us. So if you have any questions about uh, the Puppet extraction, anything that's still unclear from the information that we've been sharing on the community, just please post your questions for us, and Andra will do his best to answer them for you. Um, another noteworthy change with this release is that you can now enable the experimental host details page. You, If you've been attending the demos, you probably have been hearing about um, or been watching basically all different demos from different features that are being added to the host details page. Today, we'll also have a few extra ones that are, have just been merged and are planned you know, for future releases so it would be really great if you could take a look at the host at the new page tell us whether you like it or not um what is useful what isn't useful what you're missing that kind of thing it will go a long way to making foreman as um uh, your foreman experience as relevant as possible so please do take the time to write to us let us know what you think And as well as that, so as of yesterday, the third release candidate for Catello 4.2 is available for testing. So Justin also wrote that we can expect uh, to have this release generally uh, available um, probably next week. But ahead of this, why not take a look and tell us what you think of the release candidate. Um, all feedback is greatly appreciated. And then uh, finally, for the for the last time this year, and just to ensure you don't have um, any regrets, please complete the Foreman Community Survey. Uh, it's been open for it's been open since the Foreman birthday party, so it's been open for the summer. So I think it's it's about time now that we close it up and start processing all of your feedback. But if you're a latecomer, there's still let's say let's say a week left to get your thoughts and your comments in. You can always post your comments, but I suppose if you want to post them anonymously, <laughs> this is your best chance. So please um, tell us tell us what you really think about us. And with that, I think that's everything from me today. Again, if you've any if you've any problems with the stream, um, any questions outside of this demo, especially around the Foreman 3.0 or around the Puppet extraction, just please feel free to write to us. And uh, first up today, because um, we had unfortunately um, Marek's demo that was scheduled won't go ahead because of the demo, the demo gods, the demo environment uh, didn't go with us today. So first up today is Leosh um, with the new Ansible module um, organization info. So Leosh, in your own time, please. All right. And let me stop sharing. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yep, you're yeah, good to go. So yeah, as you said, Melanie, uh, I'm going to talk about new module uh, organization info. Uh, this module is just for getting organizations information. Uh, there is already existing module called organization, which is creating or updating module. So this one is only for getting the information. And you can see here is my playbook, calling it the organization info module and accepting a name parameter. In this case, we are looking for the different organization. and. What I'm looking for in this case, especially, is that I want to know if I have enabled simple content access on this organization. 
So I just need to register the variable and get the info. And after that, I can simply call the playbook and we'll call my machine. And as you can see that the result is false because I disabled the simple content access. And yeah, that was pretty quick. There's nothing much to say, just getting info about the organization. So yeah, back to Malay. That's great, Leosh. Thank you very much. Um, so usually it takes people a few minutes to catch up with us. Um, so we should probably proceed to the next demo. And if you do have uh, questions or comments for Leosh, please uh, feel free to, to write them and we'll get to the questions um, after at the next interval. So then up next to talk about um, a variety of new host details page UI changes is Jeremy. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, let me share my screen here. Okay, so uh, today I want to show you our latest work on the host detail page redesign. Uh, these last few weeks specifically, we've been working on some improvements to errata and traces. Um, so now that you can enable this feature, if, you, if you'd like to see them for yourself, I'll just show you where to go uh, to enable it. You go to Administer and Settings, and then there's an Experimental Lab Features. Uh, show Experimental Labs, yes. And uh, once you've done that, what you can do is go to All Hosts and find your host in this drop down here. Is a new details page. So that's how you get here. Uh, so right now we're looking at errata. Errata, as you may know, there, there are software updates that are recommended to apply on your system. So in this table, we see what we call installable errata. And uh, those are errata that both update a package installed on this host and are available in the host content view and lifecycle environment. Uh, so the first thing we've added is if for some reason this list needs to be refreshed or recalculated, we've added this recalculate action here. So it's pretty straightforward. You get a notification here. You can view uh, related tasks. Normally, we just take you to the actual task. Um, but there was some silly technical reason that we take you to the list in this case. But anyway, we can see the task is already complete. Uh, and if my list of errata were actually out of date, you might see a different list now, but I think I'm gonna see the same list because I've already recalculated several times. Uh, the second thing I wanna show you with errata is uh, table row expansion. You know, you have this link here and this, this will actually take you to the old errata page with all of the uh, erratums details. Uh, but what you can also do is click on this uh, expansion caret here. And so uh, on the left side, you see a tree view with all of the bugs, CVEs, packages, and et cetera, that the errata applies to. On the right, we have all of the basic info, and you can even click to show the full description, uh, which can be very long sometimes, and click again to hide it. So that's what we've been working on with uh, errata. Now I'm going to switch over to my other computer here and show you what we've been working on with traces. The thing I'm actually most excited about is the, this uh, multi-select functionality that we've built. So we have this uh, selector here. It displays how many items are selected, obviously. Uh, but the cool thing about it is it remembers across different pages which items are selected. So you see I'm on page two here, and it still says there are four selected. And I can go back to page one and see those two items and these two items. Uh, we also have a drop down to select none or select everything on the page, which works great. And then you can also click here again to select none. Uh, by the way, there's a select all that's gonna be added soon. Parth is working on that. It'll probably be in the next demo. Uh, and then the one specific thing that we've added with traces uh, is the restart app button is now active. So you can choose which traces you wanna restart on your host and click restart. It uses remote execution to go ahead and uh, 
restart that service or app that needs restarting on your host. And uh, if the demo gods are with me today, then this task should complete. There we go. Uh, that is all I have for today. Any questions? Uh, I'm always there. on IRC or ask here. We have we have one here for you, Jeremy. So um, yeah. the the question is, uh, I've heard that in uh, 3.0.1 will uh, the 3.0.1 will no longer mark uh, this new host details page as experimental. So will these Catello tabs also appear there without enabling the experimental features? Uh, no, you'll have to. It, you'll have to enable the experimental uh, to see any of the Catello tabs, but it's uh, if you have that enabled, you'll also see the Catello stuff as well. Cool. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And I'll just have a quick look for other questions, but I haven't seen any. And if you do think of something for Jeremy, please feel free to ask throughout the demo. Thank you very much. Uh, for those, Jeremy, and we shall move on to Marcus. And Marcus is going to talk to us about um, applicable Debian packages and also uh, the download uh, on-demand download policy for Debian repositories. Yes, thank you, Melanie. So um, let's share the screen there. Um, so I actually uh, already presented about the applicable Debian packages uh, feature, but um, since then it now has been thankfully uh, been merged into Catello, so it will be available in Catello 4.3. So once again, a big shout out to all the people who uh, helped with reviewing it. So uh, Justin, Jonathan, and Ian, I think, and especially uh, to Matthias who initiated the whole feature. Um, so um, this is actually a big milestone in the Debian story, so to speak, uh, as far as content management uh, goes. Um, so I have a Debian uh, repository here, and I also have created a content view for this. And I have two versions. One is in the lifecycle environment dev. Um, I also create the host there, which is in the dev lifecycle environment, and we now already see, OK, there is an installable um, dev package there. If we click on that, um, we see the overview for the content host buster, and we see, oh, yeah, we can upgrade the Python subscription manager um, package here to a new version. Um, as you sure know, this means that this package is actually in the same lifecycle environment, so it is uh, upgradable without um, yeah, in, um, putting it to the next lifecycle environment. Um, you can also see uh, the applicable dev packages in the dev packages page. So just to see where we are, we are currently here in content types dev packages. I'm, present, I'm presenting all this on my forklift, so I pre-opened all the stuff because uh, pages tend to take some time to open on the development environment. So on the packages, you can now um, not only filter by upgradable, also by applicable. So applicable are the Debian packages that would be available to the host um, if it goes to the next lifecycle environment or uh, the next content version is, pub, uh, is promoted to the new to the lifecycle environment it is in. And yeah, we can filter by upgradable. We can look at the details page and we also see, OK, there it is applicable to one host and is upgradable for one host, which is both um, the Stabian Buster host. And if I now on the host upgrade the package by doing an up upgrade, uh, apologies that you can't see this, but I only shared the browser window here. Um, so just pitch, and it should should then upgrade profiles here. And if I reload the page, we should see that there is actually a no more installable package if the page loads sometimes. That was what I was talking about, of the pages being taking some time. Come on. 
now we see it's installed, so no longer available. So if we promote um, the dev lifecycle environment to the next uh, content view, we would basically see all of these packages to be upgradable, which are now just applicable. Yeah, um, as I said, it's thankful. It's thankfully has been merged. Um, I think starting this uh, starting this week. So now it's fairly easier to try it out if you want to. Um, so please do. And if you find any problems with it, yeah, please tell us. So just open issues or contact me in the chat. Um, the second thing I want to show you is something that uh, I made a pull request to recently. Um, when using Debian repositories, um, it was until now not possible to configure the, um, the download policy. Um, so the download policy is basically, um, you can set it here on the existing um, repository and you can either set it to immediate or to on demand. Immediate is the normal um, states basically what you expect. So if you sync a repository, then it also downloads all the, um, the packages that are available from the upstream repository with the on-demand mode. Um, you basically tell the underlying pulp to just um, sync the package information, but not the actual binaries, um, which is fairly great for testing because you can just download a Debian main repository with its uh, 58,000 packages and basically don't utilize a lot of disk space, which is especially uh, useful on the forklift, which has out of the box, I think, 30 to 20 gigabytes, which is by far not enough to sync a whole Debian repository. And yeah, there's a pull request for that now. Um, if you want, you can try it out on your forklift and yeah. If you uh, do then sync something, you can see here, uh, you get a lot of associating content, which is the package information, but you only, uh, the, um, the part three only downloads, in this case, 11 artifacts, which are basically all the package index files and the release file and all the meter and data of the uh, repository, but none of the actual Debian packages. Yes, yeah, slight warning about this. We we are currently thinking about whether this uh, feature is really a, a good thing um, to offer because um, on most Debian repositories, um, when packages change, uh, the old packages usually um, get removed from there. So uh, consider you have uh, synced your Debian main and then you leave it uh, hanging around for some time and then you finally uh, have a have a host you want to pub, uh, want to install with it, and then uh, it, uh, Pulp tries to download the packages, but they're no longer there because uh, the upstream packages has been have been changed for uh, yeah uh, for quite some time now. So this might uh, tend to be a little bit dangerous depending on um, the actual Debian repository you use. But yeah, if you want, you can just download the PR and try it out. And that's all I want to show you today. Thank you. Cool, and this is expected in your, I suppose the, the plan is if all goes okay, Marcus, that this is for, for that, uh, Catello 4.3, is it? Uh, yes, if it gets merged in time and be considered good, then maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, no, that's uh, that's great, Marcus. Thank you very much, and congratulations on finishing um, finishing up with the with the applicable Debian packages. It's um, quite a lot of work. Um, what I just wanted to, if there are any questions for Marcus, please um, please ask now. But also, um, I just wanted to clarify jeremy andre is there anything in terms of that question from before is there anything that needs to be clarified i can see there was a bit of a conversation here is are we good yeah i mean if i understood the question right there's there's um there's no separate setting for catello there's no need to um 
there's no need to enable anything. If you can see the new host details page, then you can see the Catella part of it as well. Perfect. So if the page goes uh, in production, then all the Catella tabs will go with it. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thanks very much. And let me just check one more time. OK, I think we're good to go. Thank you again, Marcus. And we can move on to Samir, who is going to talk to us about UI updates to the content view page, um, removing content view in, uh, from an environment and deleting a version or versions. Hey. Uh, thanks, Ben. So I'll go ahead uh, and all right. So uh, this demo is uh, related to removing versions, content view versions from specific environments. That's one flow. And also to delete a version completely from all environments. So here I have a test content view, which has uh, three activation keys and uh, one host here for the setup. So I'll just show the flow here. So this has one version, which is promoted to three environments here. So we have a couple of new actions here. So one is remove. And what we can do with this is you can select the environments that you want that version to be removed from. So you can select anything here. We have this dev one environment, which has one host and one activation key. So if I select this, there are flows that are added, which is to reassign affected host, reassign affected keys. And that is when you'll be able to remove it from the environment. You can also see this warning, uh, which says, uh, which allows you to delete the version completely. That happens because you're selected like all environments that the version is in. So uh, when you do that, you get the option to delete the version completely. Uh, let's remove that and go ahead to the next step. So since one of the environments that we selected had hosts attached, so we get an option to reassign those hosts to a different content view. So let's say we want to do this. You can also see which hosts are attached to that version. So you can do this. Next step is to reassign activation keys. It's uh, fairly similar. You can go ahead assign it to any content view you want to. You can see which, <coughs> sorry, you can see which activation keys are getting impacted by this. And then you can <coughs> review what you're trying to do. So it will tell you uh, the environments that the version is getting removed from, what, what new content view in which environment your host and activation keys will be moved to. So and if I click remove, that should start the task. So let's do that. I will show you the progress of that task. And once it's complete, it will refresh, show you the current state. Uh, the second thing is to delete the version completely. So when you do that, it just uh, selects every environment that it is in. And you can go ahead and delete the version completely. So, mm -hmm. all right. and you have successfully deleted all versions. Uh, and just to verify, we moved everything to CV3. So we have all the activation keys and holes in the content view CV3 now. And yeah, that's pretty much it for my demo. 
Looks great, Samir. You just um one of your teammates uh says that the task progress uh, looks great. Um let me see now. Have we any other questions for Samir? And I think we are good. So up next is Andrew, who's also going to talk about uh, UI updates to the content view page, but um, component view versions, um, details, and routing, I think. Hello, all. Can you see my screen? For sure. It's coming up awesome. now. OK, so um, as I've done in my previous demos, I'm going to quickly compare uh, to show you the difference between the old UI and the new UI that we've built. Um, so here is our content views in the uh, new UI. And in the old UI, it's here. So I'm just going to step in to my view here in both of them. So this is a, a composite content view, um, just for context. Um, but I'll start with the first changes that I've added uh, with one of my PRs, which is the routing change. So uh, when you receive this in a, a new update coming near you, let's say, uh, you will see that the there's a little bit of a change in how the URL is presented. Um, now it'll say content views. It'll tell you the ID or number associated with that content view. And then it'll have a hash to tell you which tab you're currently on. And if you jump one further in, if you go to like a details view, it'll continue with that same methodology where it's telling you the version ID and then the tab that you're currently on. And I'll get to this in a minute. Now, if you're looking at the older UI, you have slash content views. You do have the tab that you're on, but now you have a few URL parameters. And if you jump into the version view, um, yeah, you have a kind of semi-similar view, but you're not told which tab you're currently on here in the UI or in the URL. Now to take a look at the version details view, which I just jumped into here. So this is the new UI um, for the version details view. And we've kind of set up the table a little bit differently than we have in the previous one. If you see here, our repositories are separated out into their separate um, components. So we have yum, and Docker, and file. Um, here, you'll see that repositories are kind of combined together. And we do have a type associated with each. So that's a single table, which is kind of streamlined this view a little bit. Um, but all of the other associated tabs are present and available here uh, in the new view. So this adds quite a bit, quite a few pages, quite a few tables. And I'm not going to go through each and every one. I just wanted to kind of demonstrate how the new UI is looking compared to the old UI, which has top level tabs here. And that is all for me on this update for the content view. Thank you, Andrew. And I think there, for the most part, we are, we're a few seconds ahead here of the live stream, but I don't see any questions, Andrew? So I think we are safe to to move on for the moment uh, to another uh, content view UI update. And this, we're entering into our Animal Crossing phase of the the demo once again. So hello, hello, Chris. Hey, how's it going? Um, all right, let me share my screen here. Um, All right. Uh, can you see that? Okay. Yep, I okay. can indeed. Okay. So the first demo I'm going to do is to show off the um, the new content view module stream filter. Uh, so I'll go ahead and do a quick comparison, like Andrew did. Uh, if I go to content views, and I go to view. Yum content filters, and I make a filter. We'll just call this module stream. Um, 
this is the old UI. You can basically just add a module stream uh, and list and remove them. Uh, so the new UI, what we've done is I think here, Chris, is there anything you can do about your um, losing you a little bit? Um, is that better? Yes. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm working from my office. So I don't have a headset. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and make a filter here. Get one. I'm going to do is call it demo. Go ahead and make a module stream. <laughs> Include. Uh, so this is the new UI page. Uh, so from here, we can actually click on Add. And as you see, it refreshes. Um, and it actually shows Added here. Um, I can remove them. Uh, and it removes it dynamically from here, so I don't have to add more buttons. I can add, um, I'll add these three guys. Uh, we have a bulk remove and add as well. So these three guys. And then if you notice, they are at the top then. So they don't, they change positions. So the added is shown first. Uh, and same with that, we can remove them. Um, and then also adding, clicking one of them and clicking add filter rule does the same thing. Um, so you don't have to, you can use whatever is preferred. And then we do have the auto search capability. Um, so we can search um, the table by, by that as well. Um, and pagination works as well. We also have it where you can apply and uh, see all the repos in the content view, or just we can apply a certain subset. So we've got this repo right here. Um, so that's the first demo. I don't know if there was any, give it a few seconds to see if there's questions on that. And if not, I'll move into the second one. Don't think so, Chris. Okay. Um, so the second one is uh, in Vert Who configuration, we've added support for the Nutanix uh, provider uh, hypervisor. And so there's in Nutanix, let me show a couple things here. Um, so Lucy uh, contributed this, um, and I'm doing the demo for her. Um, so we've got um, two pieces. Uh, let me show you the first thing. Go into this. There's Element, which is a, it's the, UI to control to um, manage one cluster. And then we have Prism, which manages multiple clusters. Um, so I'm going to go and take a look at this element here. I'll show you the new form. I'm going to edit this guy. Uh, so we have a new drop down type called Nutanix AHV. Um, and the server. We do have, um, you do have to use the IP address. Um, pretty much most of the stuff is going to be the same. Your username, password, interval. Um, the two things that are different are going to be the Prism flavor, which I mentioned. We have to select, you know, depending on how big your cluster is in your environment, you can pick which one you want to have. Um, and then the AHB update interval, uh, by default, you don't have to include a value. And this is basically how the VM to host mapping with inside Nutanix work. It's different from your actual um, interval setting here. Uh, this is just how often Vert Who goes and checks those, uh, checks the hypervisor and reports back to Catello. Uh, but this is actually how often we report, um, how often we gather statistics in Nutanix. So, and then if you notice too, that we have a new option called enable AHB debug. This goes, if you're having issues, it's good for troubleshooting. This has to be enabled along with the debugging output in Candlepin or Vert Who. And if you try to, if you notice this, we have, if I click here, we bring up uh, two dialogues to alert the user. Um, and then so if I try to uh, so we'll go ahead and, and you can see here that these are actually set up and they're synced in correctly. Um, and if we go to our content host here, uh, you should see, yeah, so we see the Nutanix uh, hypervisor being reported in uh, by Vert Who. And I'll just show real quick um, some validations that we've added, and then I'll switch over to Hammer and show some things that we've added there. 
Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and just create a new for who config real quick. And let's call it. Up. Uh, um, so I'm going to do, um, if we obviously nothing selected and I hit submit. Um, we have validation for that. Um, if I click AH, enable AHV debug, and I do not click the enable debugging output, we'll see that it does not, um, we get a, a, another validation there as well. Um, so that's it as far as the UI piece. Um, let me switch over to the hammer piece and show you that real quick. Stop sharing. Alrighty, um, so let me go ahead and this is my hammer box here. And so um, let me go ahead and we'll take a look at the for who configuration and show the new options. I can type the, which ones I want. All right, so we're gonna look at the number two. Um, so we do have basically coming back the AHV prison flavor, the enable debug, the status. Um, what we have done is we've added some validation where if I, let's take a look at number three, camera hypervisor, uh, we don't see anything about AHV or so forth. So we did correct some of that. We noticed that some of the hypervisor um, information was being passed along, even if like, for example, Qvert, it would show up in the VMware part. So we fixed some of that as well. And then also we added some options um, for validation as well um, on the hammer side or on the, uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and try to make a hypervisor of VMware with the Prism flavor. Uh, before this would actually let you, we found this bug while we were testing, it would actually pat you, allow you to pass in data. So we, uh, we fixed some things on the hammer side and the, the model validation. Uh, so as you see here that we can't add that Prism flavor for VMware. Uh, so forth, and um, and it works. We we cross checked all of them. So like for example, Kubevert, you can't you know pass in you know Prism AHV stuff and so forth. Uh, let me stop sharing here. That's all I had for the hammer side. That's. I had unless there was any questions. No, you're you're good. I wasn't sure was there was there something else or not. So thank you, Chris. Uh, yeah. I was like, all oh, from the hammer. We've had the web UI. We've had the hammer. What is he going to do? What trick is he going to do next? <laughs> Bringing up the bells menu, the loans. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so thank you very much, Chris. There is one question on the live stream for Jeremy. So the question is, do you recommend to activate the show experimental labs on a production server? Um, the, the person is concerned about security issues, any potential? Um, so the experimental picture is, is for the experimental labs. That's just for the content view part. The Nutanix for who configuration is not included in that. That's, that's separate. Uh -huh. Sorry, I think the quest the question was oh. yeah for yeah. Sorry, Chris, the question was for kind of aimed at Jeremy's um, oh, sorry. demo. No, you're grand, you're grand. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just thinking about security issues. I don't, I don't really think it would hurt anything, but uh, if if you want to be safe, you can always leave it turned off. Yeah, I think it should be very safe. Uh, so unless uh, we do, we really mess up something and leak information that one user shouldn't see, that might happen in the UI. So it's not totally safe, but uh, I wouldn't be worried that yeah. much. Yeah. But, yeah. One one thing to think about is if you have a user with limited permissions. Um, 
we would normally just not show you the option of whatever it is that you can't do. Um, but I, I don't think we've fully built that out in the new pages yet. So the result of that will be, you may be able to try to do something, but then the, the API will error if you don't have permission to do it. Okay, Doc. Thank you very much, guys, for for that. And um, there, yeah, yeah. So Jake on the chat is just um, he's kind of trying to expand that question. So I think I think we are we are good for now. So thanks, thanks, Chris, um, and thanks, Jeremy and Andre also for for stepping up there. Um, so the next. Demo, the last of the user focused ones for today is from Ian. And Ian is going to talk to us about a content view publishing update. All right, thanks. Just getting my screen shared. Um, okay, so I just have some updates related to content view publishing. Um, we just fixed a number of bugs and made some improvements. So I figured I would share. Um, and these are, I think these are all slated for Catello for two. Um, so let's get right into it. Uh, so first thing what I have just set up here is I have a content view with just two repositories. We have Apple and then we have our test zoo repository. And then I also have a filter that just excludes some random RPM. Um, and here are the repositories that I have, a big one and then a small one. Um, so I have four things essentially I want to go over. Well, more like three. So first thing we uh, improved uh, the speed of content view publishing, especially when you either don't have any filters or when you have filters only targeting certain repositories. Um, in the past, when you had to do filtering, um, we were doing backend content copies for all of the repositories, even ones that didn't have filters. But now we are not. Um, for any developer folks, we were using these multi-copy um, actions before. Now it's just single copies when you don't have filters. And as a result, instead of copying all the content over, we are simply copying over the repository version which means it's just metadata being, metadata being passed around rather than actual content. Um, we are also using a different API in the back end when there's no depth solving involved with filtering. And that is the pulp uh, modify API. Um, it's a lot quicker, but it doesn't work with depth solving. So depth solving will still be slow, but everything else should be faster. And I can just show you uh, what the speed up looks like. So this first content view that I published I had the filter affecting all the repositories, which means that the Apple copy will probably be very slow because it's got about almost 14,000 packages. And then I made it so that the filter only affects the little tiny zoo repository. So the publish was a lot faster. And so in this first Dyneflow page, um, you can see the uh, elapsed time is about four minutes. There's a 27 and then 31. And then also if you look in the history, we see two copy content calls. So this was the slow one, that was four minutes. But then when I decided to have the filter only target the little zoo repo, um, you can see that the last time was seconds. These are both 31, 44 seconds, and then 53 seconds. And then you can see it in the plan. We have copy all units, which was the quick copy versus copy content, which was the full copy. So you should all be seeing a nice little speed up in your content view publishing. We also fixed a couple of bugs. So the first bug was an interesting one, and that relates to repositories such as Apple that have errata with packages that span multiple repositories. So I'll give an example here. So I had this uh, erratum from Apple is this IO top one. And if you look at the package list, so I just, I only have the uh, x86 uh, Apple 7 thing. But you can see there's different architectures. 
There's also debug info, which doesn't come in the normal repository. So what would happen before, if you tried to filter anything out, um, our old logic, which was the bug, was that if we don't see any of the packages in among your source repositories, we just wouldn't copy the errata because the package list wasn't satisfied. But that was incorrect um, on Catello's part. So we've since fixed that. I know some users commented about it in the forums. So now you just have to make sure that you satisfy the RPMs in the, in the erratums package list that are in your source repository, the single source repo. So you don't have to worry about syncing all the other Apple repos. So as long as, um, so for example, the IO top erratum, um, I'm pretty sure I would only have this in the source repo. As long as you have that, then the erratum will be copied over. So that should make some people's lives easier who's in that bug. We also had a similar bug with source RPMs. Um, this didn't affect too many repositories, but some repos actually include source RPMs um, as independent packages on an erratum, and we weren't expecting that before. So we fixed that, which I think, which I believe is also an Apple filtering issue. So there shouldn't be any Apple filtering problems anymore. Um, and yeah, just to show, I can just, my quick demo of this, I've already published these things, so you don't have to wait for it. But um, in my first filter here, I have it promoted to this precipitation environment. Um, and I originally filtered out that one random package I showed you, but we can see in my life cycle environment, I checked for my errata and the IO top one is there. So just to prove that the filtering is fine. And yeah, that is all I have for content view updates. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, let me just check for questions. So we are coming close to the end of our demo. Um, so we have one more demo left after this. And I don't see, yeah, the conversation continued a little bit about um, security. Uh, but I don't, um, I don't see any questions for you, Ian. So I think we can we can move on to our final demo of the day, which is a developer-focused demo uh, from Andra, who's going to talk to us about improving setting definition DSL and moving setting registry to memory uh, on Foreman. Yeah, thank you, Melanie. So this is not affecting users in any way. <laughs> uh, so yeah, sorry about that for users, but uh, maybe it will be uh, more usable and easier and new features will be coming, uh, coming faster. So it won't affect some users in that way. But uh, I wanna talk about uh, how we define settings today and uh, what I'm changing in that. So we have a documentation about how to define settings for your plugin, but it's quite obsolete. So this is even an old version of that, but I will show uh, how that was done because it's not that, uh, that different. Uh, so we have a specialized uh, class that defines a setting category. And there is first issue, obviously, uh, that if you want to change setting category, you are changing the class where the, the setting is defined, which is not, not ideal. And then you just uh, have a setting uh, array and create all of them one by one. Uh, but afterwards, you are not able in the code uh, to uh, list your your setting definitions for that category in any way, just to, uh, by pulling them out of the database and hoping it's uh, what you defined in this file. So that's the other issue in that uh, in that old old way, and the main 
issue is that all of this, uh, which uh, never change, uh, are in the database. So the name of the setting description, uh, full name, the default value, all of that goes into the database, uh, which um, is definitely not ideal as we need to synchronize code and database uh, in very ugly fashion. You can read the method that's behind this and it had a lot of bugs and it's hard to touch it. And it's even hard to think about it because it, that's ha happening on every start of the application. And then changing the settings can be really messy. Mm. So then we have migrations like this just uh, to remove uh, remove setting, uh, even though for adding the setting there is no migration and it's very confusing to work with settings in any way. Uh, so no one was touching it for quite a while and it was becoming quite messy. So there, uh, there is a new setting DSL that I defined, and you can find uh, documentation for it in the new. Uh, that's the same page as uh, I was showing you. I was just showing the old version of it, and now I will show you the new version. It's how to create a plugin, because that's usually when you need to define settings when you are creating your plugin. And you would do that now in the register block of your plugin uh, with uh, DSO starting settings and a block having category. You can even use uh, already defined category. So you can add to uh, existing category, which was not possible before. And the DSO will note that this setting to this category came from this context, even though now we are not showing it in UI, but we might choose to if this will become uh, more used. So you can ad enhance the existing category or you can create new category. Um, and you know, all these informations are not written in the in the database uh, they will be held in memory so we now have uh, in memory uh, list of the settings and only the values are written in the database uh, which allows us to move the settings more more flexibly uh, between categories and loading the values is easier uh, storing values is much easier. Just changing uh, the description is not as painful anymore. And as well, it will be much faster. And just to show, this is the uh, in uh, form and version three point one. We already have general uh, category using the new DSL. Uh, this is how it looks like. We even have uh, validations uh, in the DSL and you can validate your settings easily and it looks much nicer than what we were using before uh, defining methods on some category class. So, yep, that's all from me. Please use, use this if you are a plugin maintainer as we are planning to drop the old uh, old way in version 3.2, 3.1 will, will have uh, deprecation warnings about the old, uh, old style. Thank you, Andra. I will just see if there are any questions or comments. Anyone on the call on the meet as well if you have any questions or comments feel free to speak now
but I don't think so. Let me see. Okay, Doc. So I think, yeah, I think we've come to the end today, and I don't see any further questions. So, um, basically, if you think of a question or if you're watching back at a later stage and you feedback on any part of the demo that you watched, feel free to open a new topic on the Foreman community discourse or post a comment on the YouTube channel and we'll take a look and we'll, um, we'll get some answers for you. So I'd like to thank everybody who came along today and presented and all of you who watched and asked questions and gave feedback. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, just our one, one person, Niloy, Nilaj, not sure how it's pronounced. Uh, he just pointed out to me that the community survey has no entry for Foreman 3. Dot zero because it's a lot. It's been open for a good few weeks, so it was it was before the GA. So if you are completing it, just add in a comment towards the end, and I'll get that adjusted. So thank you very much for the feedback. So Joe, oh Joel, so it's pronounced Ah Jolene, excellent. Um, um, Jolene backwards is knee lodge. Okay, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, just reading the comments. So we, so any further feedback, let us know offline, and we will be back in three weeks for another demo. So thank you all, and talk to you soon. Take care.